Welcome everyone. I'm Martha Russell and you're at the Media X Fall Seminar Series. Tonight's speaker is Tommy Mata, who is a research scientist at Phillips in Eindhoven, Netherlands. He is working with um, Hamid Ajajan here at Stanford. And um, his background is in um, fusion mechanisms for being able to capture human shape and activity in wireless camera networks. Why is this important? You're going to hear this tonight. Uh, and uh, it moves forward uh, the ability of people and technology to interact in ambient intelligent environments. Uh, Tommy's been coming to Stanford for a couple of years now as a part of the PhD that he's taking at Idaho Technical University. And we're very happy to have him today to talk to us about distributed channel methods. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everybody. I'm Tommy. Um, I'm a PhD student in Idaho University of Technology. I'm at Seattle, also uh, working as a guest at the Penetration Center. In the Netherlands, and also for students at the electroengineering department. And well, I'm keeping today quite low on technical sides my talk, but more hopefully to the students instead of also education. Um, so let's look into camera networks. Uh, camera networks in the sense of actually focusing them, their use on monitoring people. Uh, my research has been more looking into data fusion in the sense that we have multiple centers giving you rich with uh, data or whichever environment you're looking into, and then also some application concepts that have been uh, developing related to where these uh, leverage systems could be used in the future as well, in addition to, for example, surveillance analysis as well. The cameras. Uh, small introduction. I want to sort of start with looking at the cameras and computing and wireless communication. So cameras, of course, started black and white. It's like the first movie started in 1909, uh, 1908, with the train robbery. Then we have Citizen Kane, Miles Wells, then of course, it's a wonderful life by James Stewart. All of these were wonderful black and white productions. Well, then we wanted to sort of lighten, lighten it up a bit, make it a bit more diverse for people. So uh, we had color, and better color by going in the wing at 39, and already quite a bit of color. And of course, then by pen per time, the technology was probably much better. Uh, well, then already actually in the 1950s in American cinema, they also had three cinema. So, of course, they, you guys had it here already. Uh, I didn't know about it ever. Was just a few months ago, I actually realized in the 1950s in the United States, they already were showing people in some form uh, three dimensional uh, movies, which now has only computer and uh, the other companies maybe in the business. Of course, these are all are the, have been uh, introductions to the camera imaging technologies from the color first being able to use like color filters to capture actual uh, emitted uh, color from the environment. And then of course, uh, nowadays, either they use multiple cameras to based on disparity to capture the depth and then create a three-dimensional, or they do afterwards a 2D, 3D conversion, which then is more like software cracking of understanding what the scene is, the options are, and their relative distances are, and then creating the depth afterwards. So this is basically the basic tool that's right, either by hardware or the latest. Well, the latest trends in cameras have been, for example, this wonderful looking ball consisting of 36 uh, cameras um, around the ball. This is then a throwable ball, which you can throw in the air and then it captures at the same time to all the directions and then it basically creates a 360. And around for you or wherever you have to be. That's pretty cool, right? Then there's a Lytro. Uh, Lytro is also a very small device, a camera. Uh, by single press of a button, you basically do take one image, but then this one image actually is a snapshot of different depths of focus. And here, for example, is an example you see that the blowing the front is in a focus, if you see it. Then 
the brunette in the blue is in focus, then the girl in the red in the back is in focus. It's always one single snapshot, but then again, uh, the camera itself takes multiple scene frames, which is a different uh, focus points. In this way, you can again and of course, we have also Microsoft Kinect, which is an uh, example of this kind of active technologies. So technologies where you don't only passively monitor the scene, but you also throw uh, structured light or structured patterns, mostly infrared, that can be then uh, detected and used in the help of uh, understanding the geometry of the web. So this is quite much been happening in cameras, but they always still we are dealing with pixels. Uh, cameras do not see. They have image center, uh, they have some filters, they record some <coughs> light, um, light intensities as electric currents and so forth. And it usually emits a uh, center uh, shape, which is a matrix, meaning it's a matrix of numbers. Well, these numbers by themselves don't have any meaning. They're just there. Uh, the semantic meaning then comes when you start like, looking into the structure you actually see. Uh, like here is a wonderful picture of the forest come from moving. <laughs> and then for example, if you have a closer look to the knee area, and there's a matrix representation of what that actually is, that's all that camera sees. It doesn't know it's a knee of the movement. It sees, in this case, very clear cut of like an edge, a shape, a curve edge. And the whole our um, problem is that we people see everything all the time. The older we get, the more we learn to see all kinds of shapes, objects, and weird relations we see things are, but we understand why we do it is what we are seeing. Whereas computers, they don't have intuitive understanding. They understand the matrix, so we have to basically train them to do the same as people do. And of course, we have a lot of samples. We collect every day, for the 24 hours, every second, new experiences, new uh, new illusions or real things we see, whereas cameras, you cannot imp as much data. It's basically impossible uh, to train them as well as people. So basically the models you try to use to train the cameras to understand have to be much cleverer than actually be more distant. That's the basic problem of computer vision. <laughs> we start with a very low uh, level uh, where we have to work on. Um, well, a few people here know much more about large complications, but uh, I wanted to sort of show the small uh, timeline. When 1880, like Bell created the photophone, which was the first uh, um, wireless telephone, where basically you could uh, transmit uh, human voices on a beam of light. Uh, and the first experiment was like you could send all the parameters in several uh, of course, then we've had the revolution with broadcasting means with regular radio, uh, two-way walkie-talkies. It's going to be better GSM uh, masks and antennas to provide better ones in the cases for the longer distances. And now, of course, we have also satellites on the Earth, which, of course, gives us possibilities for GPS, but also uh, the Internet. And the Internet, of course, frees us in the sense of cameras. For example, the last of the right picture is of an IP. Camera. The camera that uses internet protocol to transmit all what it's seeing, or if it has a smart tool, using some processing in the camera itself, it shows uh, that it sends some parameters out to have the ability to Computing power? Well, the first of these is, uh, of course, where 50,000 did like hundreds of instructions per second, <laughs> whereas then um, Nowadays, a regular PC easily done has millions of instructions per second. It's been a huge evolution also already also in the, in the size, what we need for computational devices, but also the raw power and performance. And on the right top, there's, uh, I wanted to include this picture of the IBM Blue supercomputer in 1996. I uh, was battling as far as chess. It lost the first round, 3 to 1, but then the Guys updated uh, AI and the next turn one. It's this ever ending battle between the man versus uh, machines. I don't know where we are nowadays in the sense of 
because nowadays already computing technologies also are quite clever that you can keep maybe even open it for two hard questions and they can find out. Like I think in America there was an extra example in Jeopardy, uh, the Watson uh, computer that actually just keeps uh, all the human technologies. Um, also on the right bottom there's a mobile technologies, of course iPad 2 probably everybody knows, it's very powerful, small tablet. But also then we have the Amazon Kindle Fire, which is just now out. Uh, why I included that is that because the speed by the device itself is not huge, but then again it uses cloud computing, for example, it's a navigation of the internet services. So instead of being itself a power machine, the first level it has access to cloud computing service, which you can again give you the digital build power. Um, so that was sort of an introduction of um, my view and evolution on music technologies and then giving basically freeing them up by giving virus communications on the digital in longer and longer distances. And then of course the computing power being an important factor when you think about having small integrated cameras everywhere, you need to be small enough but also powerful enough powerful to deal with the process of the digital. So I'll for a bit further now elaborate on the motivation uh, behind my PSC research, uh, look into some multi-view data uh, related aspects and then also some external results and let's finish on some uh, conclusions I've done for the world. Um, so ambient intelligence, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term, but it's basically it's sort of a vision, vision for the future when you think about what functional electronics telecommunications and computing to do in the future. Uh, how we hope it will be that these electronic departments are there to help you, to support you in your day to day activities. Because they are aware of what is happening, they're sensitive to the environment, but also your actions and presence. Um, and of course, the ultimate goal of this kind of technology will be that it's sort of like to disappear. So people are actually just so the interface. Uh, because your devices are so small, well integrated, and uh, maybe even more um, connected uh, than they are nowadays. So that sort of the use of technology comes for a human computer interaction, not a human interaction. Um, I want one example here of an ambient intelligence system that I want to portray what is a behavior recognition. Uh, basically, all Vision related problems can be divided into three different system levels. You have the sensing and segmentation uh, level where you do the low level computer vision. Uh, in our cases, secondly, you go out tracking people and so forth. Then you have sort of the knowledge base of, of uh, higher abstractions, so the level of motion levels or, or user preferences for, for certain aspects or personal activities. So you add a bit of like knowledge. The raw data you are already building the models for them. And then you, on top of that, you have applications and environments, uh, which of course then are most likely connected. So whatever application you're thinking, you probably have always an environment. Uh, in this case, it's uh, behavior in the sense of um, are you repetitive in the behavior or not? But you'll have better user results and examples. Well, to this, of course, then you have question of fusion. Which is fusion you can do in each of these levels by yourself. Uh, fusion on a low level vision uh, features, for example, describing how the person's posture is, um, or exactly where they are in the board, for example. Or in the knowledge space, it can be more of a fusion of, we've done some data analysis and data processing to say already something about most likely it's more Uh, there you can based on also do uh, fusion because you have always remember multiple cameras in the camera networks providing basically the same data, uh, very much common and perpetual but still uh, useful data. And of course also applies to uh, applications and applications. You sort of try between uh, in, in between in levels themselves but also between levels to find good mechanisms to fuse. Uh, also, I wanted to exclude, uh, 
this includes some examples of, of what could be some image features or image measures, you know, you know maybe a one looking at people. Um, of course, you have to first of all detect people, and of course, if you detect, you're able to maybe put a template on, maybe make a segmentation, combine these two to be a bit more sh sure about your uh, person location. Um, in addition to that, you might want to also maybe describe the posture of the person. Is it upright? Uh, in the sense of, of in the top right, you have sort of a bounding box if you can see that. For the middle shield of the silver picture, you have uh, uh, posture, how upright it is, and then what do we have medium for it? It's a very rough measure of the general emotion rather than what the person is. Uh, this is some examples of how you can approach the uh, moment. I want to also introduce some applications we've been working on for my PhD. Uh, my PhD started as a visual communications PhD. Uh, we're, we're looking into basically using camera networks as a tool to create social connectedness uh, devices and social connected services. So remote sites would be connected by uh, multi camera capture and then rendering on the other side. Which would be then uh, um, uh, directed by use frequencies and so on and so On the bottom part picture, you then see uh, sort of two or three, how many you define it, like a home lab, home environment where you have multiple cameras set up, <coughs> kitchen, living area, dining area, and so forth. And there's some example pictures. Um, that was more used for uh, active radar fishing, but for a couple of uh, the third environment we looked into after sort of specified visual communication area and home in general was <coughs> shops. Uh, like me, it's a shop where people would come, um, get a, go around, uh, interact with items, maybe buy something, uh, and then visit the place and do some analysis on those. Um, primary idea was, of course, the benefit for you as a, as a shop owner is that you understand better what your customers are doing. And do they access any of the really cool areas, or if your you, if your new items ever get attention, for example, are we placing them in the right places? Whereas, of course, you as a shopper, you want to have a better experience if you can in the shop. So if you find the stuff you want better, nicer, or if you get into trouble, that something might come to help you. Instead of usually like you go to the shop, uh, you know, I don't know if comes when you need them, or they don't want to learn it, you have to <laughs> ask for them. Um, and the fourth top of bottom example is then mostly based on WSML's work on office environments and so social interaction. So here it's more same person is displayed in different um, areas of the work environment. Uh, so it's more of a study of uh, workspace uses, <coughs> and also then in the specifically on desktop area. So all of these environments we've looked into are environments that are basically must be covered by single camera. So you need to, if you want to use visual data, you need multiple cameras. So we end up with a rich, rich set of multi-view data. Uh, and of course, you assume that yeah, of course we'll, we'll do better, right? We have more data. But um, um, problem comes there. That how do you then handle it in the sense of? Because there are basically two kinds of differences. You can have sort of the same view from the, uh, the same thing from the same distance, but from a different view and angle. Or you can have the same thing also, but then maybe you can sort of the same angle, but then from a different distance. So you have always uh, differences in the angle you see the people, but also distances you see the observable. Um, and this, of course, introduces a lot of, a lot of uh, representative data. But then also some uh, some views will have something for the other. Um, these are always some things that are said. Um, but I would say the biggest difference is how to handle the differences in orientation and scale. Because you indicate one, because why is this a problem? The problem is because you have a lot of centers, but you don't want to specify your processing for each center to be specific. Otherwise, if, uh, if, uh, like if the application and the data we use in the networks will take forever. You want to have some generic uh, 
or modules that will work with each camera the same way uh, and still provide you basically the maximum uh, performance at that maximum accuracy. Um, so it comes down to two major factors. First of all, uh, the process you do on images and so forth, you want to have it as few independent as you possibly can. Uh, so you can use the same algorithms and also, for example, the features and the measures you want to have as robust to the differentiation and the orientation as well as possible. Can. And the se second thing is then the fusion of these process data. Uh, you want to be able to do this in all system levels, but also then still account for the violations you might have in the uh, processing of the images themselves. Because you are targeting 100% independent processing, but you will never get there. So you still have to have mechanisms uh, to sort of detect when we are violating something and maybe counter those effects. Um, let's look at some experimental stuff. Um, I started working on when you introduce multiple cameras into the environment, you are able to, of course, do the sequence application, for example, from multiple viewpoints. And what you can do then is just like the top left corner of the image. Uh, you have a silhouette image from each viewpoint, and it's possible nowadays to sort of, if you have a calibrated system, you can just back project that into a space and define what the original volume was in 3D, uh, in 3D wise that actually generates 2D projection on the image plan. Um, let me just show you a few examples of, first of all, we'll have an example of um, it's a guy doing a jumper jack and stuff. Uh, it's basically volume volume capture, uh, but connected to that, um, connected to that, you also had skin detection. You are also able to sort of portray what other ones might be uh, uh, exposed to. Uh, you saw the heat that had some. Uh, this is basically exactly the same sequence, but now you see a voxel reconstruction like it was before. Um, first of all, this time it's shown from this one single view. It's still the same sequence. Uh, it's a voxel reconstruction, so you have all of the volumetric cubes that basically make this voxel man. We see exactly the same sequence in the same view, but now we're going to pan around it. While it's doing. So what we do is we create the 3D shape and that gives us the freedom of basically showing this guy from any viewpoint we want. That's the power of it. So basically we have full immersive power and we're creating a 3D view. Uh, this is an example of um, home map, but I think we'll come back to that. Next slide. Um, so I did some uh, experiments also on activity verification. Uh, where we basically had uh, three different data sets. Um, two were publicly uh, given uh, for researchers to use. Uh, one of them provided uh, like ground truth, uh, manually outdated by people with this kind of silhouette data. So it was like ideal, no noise and so forth. Um, the other one was that they used virtual characters uh, and animated them based on motion capture data to do exactly the same. So it's a people that had to be recorded to do this. So we have uh, real people reporting and then also uh, sort of recreated by avatars but they can And the third data that I did that was actually recording in home lab a few people doing like a scripted routine now and uh, comprising of like five or six different uh, activities. Activities being walking, standing, sitting, and then also standing, interacting, something or something like that. You have five different uh, action classes you can understand what people are doing. Look at this. This video was. So, this is sort of an example of the home lab environment we have at the Lips Research Center in Icon, where basically a lot of different studies are done, uh, not only camera related, but also like lifestyle, living as well, and lighting as well. Right. Here is your sort of example of camera views. You have the kitchen, then you have the transit area, dining area. In the end, uh, the living room area. And this is a very simple group in But 
So like you can imagine, there's quite a lot of public free data sets available, but the problem is that always when you are creating a data set, people have predefined it. <laughs> Uh, people have predefined assumptions on what we're gonna want, want it to be doing with the data. So you create a specific uh, data with the specific actions or action sets, and then that of course limits uh, your freedom as a researcher in looking at the data. Well, I'm interested in this access data. Like, what do you have there? You might have a subset of those. So you end up combining some actions or you end up taking something away. And that's always the problem of using predefined action sets. Um, so in that sense, I've always ended up making my own uh, data as well on the side. Just to have my own uh, reference materials. Um, here are some numbers. Um, those are sort of examples of if you use a single view of all the views we had in the environment of the home. In the home, you had areas that were covered with three cameras, some areas with two cameras, some were only with one, depending where you are. And where the cameras were working. So you could get around 80% in the accuracy of detecting one of one of one of at least one of the five actions to the um, Then you have an example here of um, using all the data you have at the time. So it can be either all the three or the two or the one. Input means two. Uh, Mass and B has to wear the clean uh, data sets. So they don't have any they have no uh, robots issues or, or laws and so on. Uh, there, the best performance was achieved by doing the fusion in the features itself. So the features that described the modern motion of the person, what, like walking speed, all the other functions. Uh, whereas then, if you looked into more in the combination data sets or the home values, had the processing and so forth, the, the scale tip that actually not any more feature features in the or feature combination was the best. It was actually better just to go up as far as deciding what we think actually activity is, and then only combining it as this is a business So there's a bit of a trade-off on feature data was good to combine uh, when you had like a sort of soft, uh, like a clean control environment, whereas then when you introduce variation in versus shapes and uh, in the iPhones used, uh, then it was actually better to go individually the whole process and say up to an actual decision or activity. Uh, and then only combine uh, these two results between the cameras. Uh, one thing I wanted to do on the databases was actually look into what if you had like a best you can have single view selected. So if this was a single view that could give you the right feature or the right decision, and we would know we just, just use that one and just forget about the rest. Actually, already by this kind of mechanism, you still actually uh, basically all the other metals that I was studying in this uh, with this data set. So you can end up in 93 and 93. If you had this kind of oracle saying each time, for all these three, this is most likely to be the best. If there was one, give the right of uh, the whole idea. If there was a one, to give the correct right result, you would lose that. And so you are able to go even by a single view selector for very good performances. But then again, what other criteria you going to use to uh, find that best one? Because you still need to use that computer, some measures, some metrics. That would be, of course, the problem. But there is a lot of power also to be able to do that one view of all. In the shop environment that I showed before, um, we did some recordings in the shop lab itself, uh, which is an L-shaped uh, mid-sized clothing store with three cameras of Uh and then also did some simulations um, to provide a bit more clean data that was possible with uh, recorded data. And then we did some, uh, uh, basically of course, detect the track people. Um, in this case, we only also ended up quantizing some of the locations uh, recording them in a, in a matrix of precisions and using this as a, as a way to approach sort of the problem of uh, how to detect repetition. Uh, repetition was in the sense that we assumed 
that you are you are shopping and whenever you encounter a problem you start repeating yourself. You start repeating yourself in the sense that you actually start staying way too long in a certain area. Or you start repeating yourself in the sense that you return to some areas you've already been, but there's really no structure to the Or you actually start moving between two or three different regions that so clearly have something of interest in those two three major areas of areas and products. But you're still get into this area I and mean, time when maybe a system is by an uh, automated system or a custom this is the simula on the simulation data um, on two classes. So one is to detect the time uh, if you get into a repetitive loop of some kind, either staying, returning order, or actually looping. Uh, we got around 70% Accuracy is and then on the shop lab, which is the real recorded data, we got a bit more than that. Um, so the actual percentages we got were not that good. But then again, the whole approach on how we do the region and the postization and the transitions and then try to look into how the repetition manifests in this consistency. That was pretty good in the sense of it seemed quite robust into the region. Like I started to start a few independence events, a big deal. Try to uh, deal with that. Try to and uh, now we're looking with Lewis here in uh, WSML on Happy Office. We call it. We call it Versailles Healthy Office or something very clinical. But, <laughs> but then we thought, like, let's make it a bit more uh, um, joyous occasion. Um, there we look into office environments. Office environments in the sense of ergonomics. Uh, ergonomics in the sense of how people work. Uh, um, how well they perform in their work. Um, another thing was the general workspace issues. Uh, how much, for example, do you sit by your desk or how much do you get around? Because there was a nice article and study on is sitting on lethal activity, <laughs> which is quite interesting. But apparently, there's a 14 year study of 123,000 Americans <laughs> who says that if you spend sitting down more than six hours, you have 20% higher. Uh, overall, the calorie rate, and from even just forty percent. So sitting down, perfect kids. Uh, so in that sense, it's good to keep mobile in office environment. Um, another aspect, of course, is that the office is, is social interaction. Um, and there was a nice study on this as well—a twenty-year study on a bit less, on twenty people only, uh, looking into control risks of the smoking and obesity and so forth. And also there, basically they found, made only one prior discovery for themselves, but they found is that the mortality is significantly lower if there is a not social interaction, not social peer support in the office. So it is actually quite important. It doesn't make you only as a more effective, more productive way, but also as a <laughs> issues of what it is. This is good for us. Uh, in the bottom row, we have three pictures of uh, example of how we, how Louis uh, originally had uh, looking at this. Uh, based on proximity of uh, employees and also their case direction, you'll try to deduct when people are engaged in a discussion and then you will have analysis on which ones are socially uh, connecting, which ones are not, and how the whole social map uh, you know, in our office. Um, actually, I'm wrapping up already. Um, <laughs> some belief that I have uh, now after three or four years of working with camera mentors are that <laughs> monitoring cameras are here already and they're going to stay in business so that the number is just going to get higher. Um, like, for example, in China, there's already 7.4 million CCTV cameras based on the statistics I saw. Uh, that means sort of one per 400,000 people. Uh, that's nothing compared to the Big Brother uh, <laughs> where you have a camera for every 40 people. Uh, so there's been a huge discussion, especially in the uh, you know, due to this, uh, on security versus privacy. Of course, nowadays a lot of the camera networks used are used for surveillance purposes, right? They are in airports, they are in 
uh, like today I know this in Bytes Cafe in Stanford. Uh, this for surveillance cameras, this all of there in what is that six feet by twelve feet area. Monitoring there is this case I assume uh, employees themselves for a possible pet, but also for the security of these on the external cameras. So in that sense, surveillance is a hot issue nowadays, but we're, with ambient intelligence, we're actually trying to provide services that are proactive and help to our quality of life. So they are not as critical as, as you would say, surveillance is. But I think we have so many problems nowadays getting solved that we can already start focusing on that. quite a lot of quality of life and services getting by on day. So this is sort of the building on that. Um, well, there's always a talk about uh, acceptance because who would like to have their own mobile temperature? What do you think? Like I showed you the video clips, there would be many, many people uh, watching. But then the issue becomes you have motion sensors everywhere, right? You walk around in places and automatically some things come up, and then we know, ah, oh, it's a motion sensor, just right. It just detects your presence. But how do you know it's a detection presence? This is a small record video of you walking around. Right? But people have been telling you that it's a bit <laughs> So it's just, it's, it's just still, you have to build trust on your technology, especially when it's pushed into new venues and new environments. And of course, nowadays, if you look at the Google Glass and Skype and the amount we are all the time increasing the use of video and use of small presence of I think uh, as long as security issues can be issue in the sense that you have policies within who can access the data, where is it transmitted, that you can see what is being transmitted, uh, and also what is being recorded or introduced. As long as that sort of makes transmission for yourself, you can build up uh, confidence that you should sit on the accept it as well. Um, so far I've been always using my research passive cameras. Uh, so cameras that sort of don't just take a, a tray or Including the environment, anything infrared, such as light or so forth. Like the Kinect nowadays is very good in detecting human posture, human gestures, uh, based on, on the drawing stuff that they are detecting the infrared reflections and the building, for example, in its case, 25 points on your body, uh, 30 times per second, which is pretty good. It works really good when you're up to At upright, if you, if you sit down, it already has problems, but that's something that the software can. Um, and I think there's a huge potential in ambient intelligence. There's a lot of projects in energy aware buildings where presence can be used to minimize the energy use of air conditioning, meaning, light, and so forth. Also, elderly care, where uh, people basically that cannot be monitored and not, cannot be 100% safe in their house, they can have the same system properly if they do kind of in those situations. They would be. They would be Triggering the system that can be uh, um, And also, of course, we always will have really cool stuff, really interesting uh, <laughs> gaming, uh, immersive environments for foods, uh, also 3D, uh, 3D cinema coming up. But I believe also the uh, introduction of more immersive environments, more fit to, to more immersive resources, more immersive uh, rendering of the content. Thank you. Great time for some discussion. Would you take some questions? <coughs> sure. All right. Sure. You you call the hand that you see. Ah. Come on, yours. You must have started. Uh, I can ask you questions. Uh, is there any reason not to use active cameras? So uh, you've been using only passive cameras so yeah. far. Was there a reason for, or what was the what was the reason behind that? Are there disadvantages to using active? Basically, the first issue, of course, is the cost. Uh, you can, nowadays I've been using it to record multiple more data sets, such regular webcams. So you can imagine the speed would be very fast. Mm -hmm. so, and then you have the box, you can install it, connected to USB, you can use it to be in the, so you have software connected to a radio. Uh, whereas these active sensors are still the big on the pricing side. I would like to say why I ended up in this. 
what I've been interested in back in the years as well. But I mostly work with Philips. Uh, Philips is not a surveillance company, so they're not pushing for expensive cameras. They're pushing in, in the sense of, we want to have a product in the end that can be in the box, that can be shipped, and can be installed directly to the end. It makes sense. Yeah, but, but then again, you add that you add a lot of price to, uh, but you add a lot of price to the deal with the per per so item is price right. ten times the cost, right? And that's not even the best. Could you clarify what you mean by active camera? Okay. Active camera is sort of um, a camera that also has a light emitting sensor. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, this the in the Kinex uh, sense, I think it creates this kind of grid. Of lights uh, by infrared, which basically shoots and then looks into the deformation of, of the slide. It, it hits a flat surface, well, it's a scale of the white light. But if there's an intrusion, it will create basically a bit of a pump of the light. Mm -hmm. And then it just uses a lot of, uh, then it captures, of course, this. So it throws something out there and only specifies in detecting how does, how, how, how does that uh, be transformed by the environment. Then you fix that and then it uses clever algorithms to get what kind of depths are we talking about and what kind of shapes. So I'm sorry, you said Philips is not interested in surveillance? No. <laughs> what what <laughs> markets? At least not three years ago. Yeah, what markets is Philips? Um, Philips is in the health, yeah. uh, lighting, and well being, I would say. You always can come. You are free to join them. Yeah, because he's also similar to uh, yes, the uh, Yeah, Philips has uh, it's basically three main uh, sectors uh, uh, consumer lifestyle, consumer electronics, mm -hmm. um, healthcare, and lighting. So there's right. a lot of healthcare products, for example, all the imaging, x rays, so forth. Most likely go for Philips if you go for any And I think Tommy's work is mostly in the consumer lifestyle. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which again is actually. One of, I think that's again one of the lives mm -hmm. of all sectors, fields of energies, up and back. So they really have been focusing on it, of course. Um, as you have the multiple camera angles, uh, in theory you could uh, channel those images into some sort of computer analytics and, and classify the images that you're seeing in some way if you have the right algorithm. The Department of Homeland Security often talks about how they look for um, suspicious people mm -hmm. uh, in you know, airports and things like this. Yeah. And they have luggage as well. Sorry? They have luggage as well. That's why they say you should not be the luggage because they would have right. algorithms specific for that purpose. If somebody who leaves it there and doesn't come back to the time it will be marked by the system of the Exactly. So, so, in theory, your, your system could be used with the right back-end analytics to uh, uh, pull up something that could be of, of interest, and then it could be viewed by a human to determine if it's, in fact, it's an actionable image. Yeah, you can, you can always make sort of a draw between how far you can process and go into uh, <coughs> some of the PRR traction on the sense of how we see something abnormal or not. And that could be already because they pop it up for the monitor. If you want to keep the person in the middle, because it's always the person is still the best in the end to make the final decision. Okay, so do, is that something that, that you could work on, or you, would that be some subsequent uh, add on technology that someone else would work on? Definitely, is, uh, like ground monitoring in the sense of the air force and so forth. Quite well done because the optical optical wall and how well the architecture sort of supports uh, the volume of people coming to the drop out. Uh, and also looking in crowd behavior sense which quite breaks up the software that you can detect this kind of abnormal growth behaviors as well. That's already there. So I think there's a lot of stuff there because I've been mostly looking into people, I just trying to detect people uh, so in a nutshell describe them their most important features for us when looking into the application of the So considering your, your sponsor is not interested in surveillance, right? So looking, looking <laughs> at other... <laughs> I'm the, uh, 
as long as it's with people, I wouldn't want to start looking into taking a certain kind of case. <laughs> because that's sort of factory line work. Uh, right. In factories, a lot you have lines, production lines, where you know exactly how the product is looking. Right. So you can create a very good template, for example, to match that Easter egg crack, for example, in the one of the shipping the owner of the That's sort of, it's for me, not a captivating enough. You know. But then again, people are in form of quality, are so very precise in shapes and dimensions, cross dimensions. That sense, it makes it a bit more dynamic, of the much right. more difficult, but they can move the, the, the question around, around uh, a non surveillance is around um, do you know of any work being done in physiotherapy or in sports around the uh, analysis of behaviors over time and the results of those behaviors against data that's actually very rich, such as medical records? <laughs> <laughs> sports scores, fouls, etc. I don't know the, of that extensive of a behavior at this matter one of those cases. I know some work on, for example, like using using uh, use camera network score, detecting how good your baseball swing is, or how good your throwing technique is, mm -hmm. or how good your car swimming is a compared to the play. So a longer all the time uh, gathering of this as a behavior, I don't know. Do you know that? No, that's what I was asking, and especially not from the individual, where there's been a lot of focus, but in groups, because it's it's something that's uh, it's highly competitive in the sporting and entertainment industry. It's a group dynamics. If, for example, in soccer, for example, what activity is happening on the field away from the ball? Mm -hmm. And how does that affect the performance of the team over time? And then physiotherapy, walking motions that people are doing compared to the problems they're having with their feet or their backs. That kind of thing I was curious about. Yeah, I'm curious about the um, archival and storage of the data. You said that you keep your own data. And, yeah, you know, you're and, there. And, and <laughs> if, if a person were you know, using a system, an intelligence system, for their own personal feedback and understand that they would want to keep all of the data. Yep. But as you know, some of this data might be collect in, uh, collected for a retail environment or a uh, medical environment, and it, it ends up being a lot of data. Do you have some perspectives on, you know, based on the fusion ones that you're working with, what you can not keep and mm -hmm. what, what's important to keep? <laughs> Um, like then that again depends so much on what you want to end up using that data Because whenever you would have a nice targeted mind, you can average around creating clusters, creating desired motion patterns, desired ways of doing stuff. And then you would have the outliers in the sense of bad examples uh, that you would use uh, a lot of reduction. We do not need to uh, store everybody's like fitness monitoring data and then use that. Because, for example, my fitness monitoring at home would be a quite interesting example of how people you can show like an avatarization, for example, of a house and then the kind of basic uh, jumping jack of the most like and then the person can do that. And then your uh, so performance can be matched up against that. Uh, of course, this could be also then personalized based on your history, but also the history of other people using this uh, same thing. So, but um, that is a huge problem because, especially with video, uh, like we with Lewis uh, now work with 110 gigs from office environment. <laughs> uh, we decided to just record everything. And so that we have a chance, of course, reduction of the data, knowing already where we're going to go, in the sense of just really reducing, creating some text files that capture the essential and then explain the way But for research purposes, it's the same in the video, so so good, because you can end up using the video for very mm -hmm. Have you thought about uh, incorporating other kinds of sensors? So, for activity practitioners, I can imagine 
clue that you can use a microphone to hear if somebody's talking or something like that. Especially in some kind of environments. It would be really useful when somebody sits on the couch. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it's just, it's just no, you don't have to make it. You have to. You don't have to make it so difficult by using video for yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can turn it up. Or yeah, for sure. Uh, especially because of my supervisor is working for you, so we always, or it's just uh, whatever problem we uh, decide to face, looking into it, what what benefits if we have audio, audio process to the audio cues, uh, in which case. We and definitely you can see the power immediately uh, of it simplifies some problems that my vision might be on but be difficult or almost impossible to do that. Um, so in that sense, I definitely believe in that yes, active technologies will be really they already work in much better capacity. But I mean, if you can combine those with clever audio processing, also pressure sensors, also RFI tags, how they use it. Sure, that it's, it's totally working in this way. You were saying, for example, you can have a lot of power in the US. So, all these that we can be confident I think they should. Because, whatever I've done so far, uh, you can have really cool stuff, uh, really complicated, but at some point it just gets too complicated to actually run in a reasonable frame rate that is usually <coughs> for the real time and the only way then is to back, step back and use and look what kind of other methods you can use to help out. Help out in the drawback situation or in the, the proper situation. Exactly there, I think, the only one the is important. Thank you very much. Thank you.